He's going to be talking about a Norwegian physicist who's most known for his work on the Aurora Borealis. And his talk is entitled, Experiments of Christian Birkeland. Jim Hardesty. Good morning, and I'm very happy to be here. Is this working? Everyone can hear me? I hope. Good. Talk louder. Talk louder. Talk louder. Okay. All righty. Um, before I start, uh, just a couple of uh, things I'd like to say. First of all, I always uh, like to uh, mention uh, our friend of many of us, uh, Harry Goldman, who is not with us here uh, today. He's uh, busy and not feeling well. A lot of you, I hope, know Harry as the uh, founder and uh, person that's kept the Tesla Coil Builder Society alive for many years and uh, we keep trying to get him to come out here every year but I'd like to at least uh, acknowledge him because he's certainly been a great deal of help and inspiration to all of us. He's gone in the hospital on the uh, 6th of August I believe for uh, an operation and anybody who uh, I'm sure dropped him a line or whatever and wish him well would be uh, appreciated. I, I'm, I'm positive. Uh, the talk this morning is about the uh, Norwegian physicist Christian Birkeland, who lived from 1867 to 1917. The reason why I've picked this particular topic to, uh, to talk about here is that uh, my uh, contributions, uh, I hope they are that, to, uh, to the uh, knowledge that's uh, put forward here has been in the area of vacuum discharge tubes and in the work of uh, physicists in the uh, latter part of the 19th and early 20th century dealing with the discovery of the electron and uh, some of the incredible things that have come from that and uh, I feel it ties together with the uh, uh, the work that uh, Nikola Tesla is involved with because uh, of his own work with uh, vacuum tubes which I think they're most of the information and discoveries on that is yet to come I hope that the presentation here, which I'm going to try and keep very simple because it's so darn many things to talk about, will be of some inspiration, at least some, uh, some points of uh, departure for uh, other researchers and so on, perhaps uh, in the uh, opening up of some of these uh, wonderful mysteries uh, concerning the electron and, and such. Uh, Birkeland is a rather curious figure, and he is uh, well known for a number of things uh, besides his, uh, his uh, vacuum discharge studies in relationship to the aurora. The, uh, uh, in 18, uh, I guess around 1890, uh, he was finishing up his studies under Henry Poincaré. He also spent time uh, studying uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, topics with uh, uh, people such as Hertz, as well as another gentleman, uh, which we won't talk about, Delarive. So his pedigree is pretty good. He, in my opinion, should be considered as one of the Maxwellians, I think they call them, such as Heaviside and Fitzgerald and so on, who, uh, you know, uh, Maxwell's uh, theories were really not, uh, I might say, modified uh, reasonably so that uh, they, they had uh, uh, applications until a number of these people really uh, did some experiments and, and, and really made it more understandable and workable. Uh, Birkeland, uh, they said from the time he was a child, I guess this is said of a lot of people, you know, people play with different things. They said that from the time he was able to uh, uh, do anything, he always had a magnet in his hand, dealing with magnets and so on. And so it uh, is uh, not untrue in his later life that that should be uh, one of the important things that, uh, that he worked on. Uh, he's also famous for early, I guess you might call them railgun experiments uh, with uh, 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 electromagnetic cannons he was able to uh, did some amazing experiments I won't go into that uh, the only funny story is is that uh, he had built this amazing cannon uh, a magnetic cannon which worked very well uh, until he had the uh, I guess the military and the financiers up there when he operated it and uh, it, it uh, was a grand display he said but his stock went from 300 down to zero because everything went up in flames however the the projectile that he had set in there hit the target some considerable distance away but uh, it didn't quite work out uh, um, he also was the uh, uh, one of the first in fact the first person in Norway 
after the discovery of x-rays to immediately begin to demonstrate x-rays and to have tubes and, uh, and equipment made uh, to run experiments with cathode rays and x-rays and of course the fact that uh, magnetism was his uh, a great, great interest. He experimented with the uh, deflection of, of cathode rays uh, in a magnetic field, uh, which leads on to where we're uh, going to be going with this uh, talk about his work with the aurora. And uh, he also uh, sp uh, spent a great deal of time and energy setting up observatories uh, uh, in the polar region in northern Norway as well uh, to observe and study the effect of what it called magnetic storms occurring as uh, w in conjunction with auroral phenomena, so that he could actually make uh, magnetic measurements and he could also get s uh, some idea about field strengths and so on that were going on. So he had a considerable amount of information on that, which was published in his uh, greatest work, a uh, huge book that's uh, uh, not readily available, but I did manage to, to get a copy of it to study from the Cornell University Library. It's called um, on the cause of magnetic storms and study of the uh, Aurora Polaris expedition of 1902 and 1903 in which he and a group of people set up observatories uh, 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 at uh, the best of which were at Mount Halde in uh, northern Norway and uh, they spent a lot of time uh, running and doing experiments of that particular nature. Uh, I can see forward here. Uh, maybe uh, all I need to do is see my, my crib sheet here. If you could maybe turn the lights down a little bit, Daryl. Just let me have this here, then we can see the slides a little bit better. And uh, uh, I think that's pretty good. That slide there looks like it uh, had a little bit of difficulty. Uh, anyway, this is uh, his major uh, uh, on top of uh, Mount uh, Hadla in northern Norway, his uh, uh, aurora uh, and uh, magnetic storm uh, observation area. Uh, another thing which occurred, which I think is very curious here, um, this is a model. Uh, can you hear me? Is this working okay? Uh, okay, yeah, it just, it's, huh? Little loud, boy. <laughs> uh, the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century uh, at the university in Oslo, uh, Birkeland's uh, early works and uh, uh, with the uh, a cause of the aurora and the... Uh, I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but I want to show you this just to get some ideas. Uh, this is a uh, actual uh, wires and, a, and a, it was built by a, a physicist there by the name of Carl Sturmer. And Sturmer, having looked at uh, a lot of uh, Birkeland's ideas about the uh, uh, quantum particles coming from the sun and getting into uh, the magnetic field of the earth, and uh, coming down into that magnetic field and causing uh, excitation of uh, uh, oxygen and, and, and nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere and then creating auroral displays. He had uh, postulated this in the 1890s. This is uh, a models, uh, and there are a number of them built here. This is another one. Uh, Sturmer uh, designed these things and mathematically uh, calculated uh, in conjunction with uh, Poincaré to try to give an idea about what happens if you were to get, uh, let's see, in the late 1890s, I think they were still calling them corpuscles, but electrons entering, coming from the sun, and then uh, in, the, in what we call the solar wind, uh, getting into the atmosphere of the Earth and uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, seeing what kind of trajectories, I believe the word they use, would happen here. Uh, this is another example of it, and we'll just move on. Here's another one, uh, a very curious study made here. That's Carl Sturmer. And uh, around uh, 1902, uh, his uh, work was being done on this for anyone who has particular interest to study that. Now, it, we go to the next phase of things here, and I hope that uh, the, some of the things I'm going to say this morning will also help us uh, to have a little understanding of another presentation that uh, my friend uh, Jim Cruiser and I will be giving this afternoon at 3 o'clock, which is uh, an actual demonstration of a classical uh, vacuum discharge tubes which were manufactured in the uh, latter part of the 19th and a little bit in the early 20th century including Crook's paddle wheel tubes and such uh, will be quite a demonstration but a little bit of explanation here that might lend to a little clearer uh, view of, uh, of what we're going to be doing then. That's at 3 o'clock by the way and I hope you can attend that. That should be something very special. Uh, this particular thing here merely is uh, looking at glow discharge and these are a bunch of phenomena that are seen in glow discharge that is pumping the air out of a tube and uh, and then uh, uh, introducing a uh, uh, DC high voltage uh, 
uh, at, at either end and creating different sorts of uh, striations and dark spaces and so on like this. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I have to have a few of these in here because one of the things that I want to explain is that uh, people like Birkeland and uh, Davik and the workers that were with them, uh, really at that particular time, and this is not only true of them, but when you think about people as far back as Faraday, uh, Geisler, Hittorf, Crooks, Goldstein, uh, Perrin, all these people who worked in this particular field, and some of you out in the audience who I know well who we spent time dealing with this know that there is a certain amazing uh, romantic, if you will, attractiveness to these kind of tubes. And so I just want to show a few and some effects. This is an extremely rare tube. It is a high-frequency X-ray tube. It was actually manufactured about 1897. It's in the collection of the Antique Wireless Association in, uh, in uh, uh, East Bloomfield in New York. And uh, what you're seeing here is one side of an operation, and there's a hemisphere there that's a, made of German glass. So the electron impact, not the X-ray impact, the electron impact that's just bouncing off of the of the uh, target that's in the center, um, we give you that apple green glow on the glass that's there. And these kind of observations uh, uh, f at this point and a lot earlier looking at other discharge tubes really led people, especially Birkeland, to give consideration to the origin of the aurora borealis in terms of the same effect that was going on here. Uh, and here is uh, the same tube. Again, uh, it's running in opposite polarity this time so that the uh, the, the um, center terminals, the cathodes, you get a different kind of effect. You can see the target in the center there. Just moving along through some of these. This is another uh, interesting colors available here. This is a, a gas x-ray tube manufactured about 1906. Uh, this here is the anode. This is the cathode over here. You can see a little bit of ion impact glow here. This tube actually is an operation and uh, the, you can see the cathode beam. This is a stream of electrons traveling across here and hitting the target here. And you can barely see down here, there's a, there's a regular uh, glass window. This tube is made of lead glass before the x-rays can come on here. It's just kind of a safety tube. But uh, you can see the focus cathode beam striking the target uh, and the colors associated with that. Here's a little more of that. This is the opposite polarity. Again, you can see the, uh, it's running in the opposite way. That is, this is the target here. It's a tungsten button inside of copper and there's the, the cathode back there. Uh, and I'm just showing you some of the colors. That's a, not a really great shot of the same thing we looked at before. And this is a little harder to see because the lights are still on, but you can actually see here the electron impact that's hitting the target, and there's a certain fluorescence occurring in there that uh, really uh, is where the x-rays are being produced. There is a, a kind of a, a very colorful display. All of these things were viewed by Birkeland and other scientists at the time. Birkeland himself decided that this was a study that really could uh, lead to some understandings of what the, the auroral phenomenon were about. And of course, living in Norway, he saw that all the time. And the curiosity about this, plus the magnetic effects uh, and all this, led him to begin his uh, particular experiments here. I just uh, show here a couple. These are more of the, some of the vacuum discharge tubes that people like uh, uh, Birkeland and others were looking at. There's some rather phenomenal effects here uh, of electron bombardment and fluorescence, as in here you can see that this is the cathode here. Electron beam strikes these objects down here. I, think that, I don't know exactly what that is. Uh, and causing them to fluoresce. That was very common. A lot of studies going on in the 1890s in this. Another, these tubes will be demonstrated this afternoon. You can see these up close. This is um, the star of the show, a Geissler tube type where there's different colored liquids and so on in here for light refraction coming through these different glass, and there are different types of glass in here. Uh, yeah, uh, just stop a moment to observe the marvelous uh, uh, craftsmanship and appreciation of the Victorian craftsmen in, in blowing something like this out of glass just for the sheer pleasure of observing electrons at work. I think it's commendable. Something today we might get some things from. And this is the same kind of thing, the bombarding. Uh, this was on the front cover of uh, the Extraordinary Science magazine. That's another bombardment tube. We have a surprise for you this afternoon. We have a tube that I feel that is orders of magnitude beyond the beauty of this tube, but we'll let you see that this afternoon for real. And uh, quickly here, this is a vacuum discharge tube, and I've just quickly run by this. Um, what we're doing here is the same thing as a spark discharge in the, in the atmosphere. Essentially, uh, you turn on an induction coil and a spark jumping between the leads of the induction coil. 
It's about the same thing that's happening here, except that the mean free path of the electrons at atmospheric pressure uh, does not allow them to travel very far before they have a lot of uh, inelastic collisions with uh, 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 atoms of oxygen and nitrogen and so on, so that the, uh, the spark is a lot shorter. If you begin to pump the tube down, then the discharge can become much longer because the mean free path, that is the path that the electron can travel from the cathode to the anode, uh, is uh, considerably longer be before all those electrons are used up in these inelastic collisions and the tube doesn't work. That's why even with high voltage you can see these corona discharges as, the, as this effect uh, reaching out, ionizing the air and so on, trying to move forward. But I'm going to go through quickly what uh, Birkeland and other scientists at the time actually were looking at. This here had been observed uh, at these vacuums for centuries. I had said in my earlier paper uh, uh, two years ago that the, the first time this uh, ever was observed was in 1674. A gentleman by the name of Picard at the Paris Observatory was walking around the barometer and was shaking this barometer and the mercury sloshing around around the tube actually was uh, uh, the phenomenon called uh, triboluminescence in which the uh, mercury actually rubs electrons off the glass and then there is a, a, a relaxation, recombination thing going on and you see light actually. And he observed this and uh, didn't really know what it was, but this was, uh, that was the first, uh, the first neon sign sort of thing. And after that, there were many experiments. Let's take a look at it as we go through this a little further. It's a little brighter. And you can see there are certain effects here. I won't get into extremely detailed explanation of this, but the cathode is down at this end. And uh, essentially what happens is uh, and normally gas that is unaffected, we wouldn't be able to conduct electricity. But due to cosmic rays and, and uh, ultraviolet rays and other things, it can actually impact those atoms, uh, ionize them. So we have, uh, we have positive ions and uh, free electrons floating around in a tube like that, we can actually get those to be attracted to the, to the op to poles uh, of opposite to their own charge. And as electrons starting out from the cathode down here, moving forward, gain enough speed, the first thing they do is they can uh, they gain enough speed to excite the oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the tube. They will get it moving a little faster, and then they can ionize. And the ionization process essentially produces enough free electrons that can, uh, or free uh, positive ions that can uh, bombard the uh, cathode and release more electrons and produce uh, simply what's called a, a, st a steady state in the, in the glow discharge, which allows the thing to continue. Otherwise, it, it would, th those uh, uh, free particles would be used up and you wouldn't see a discharge. Uh, anymore, but this produces a steady state, and as the electrons continue, their speed slows down. Essentially, in the discharge here, where you see uh, there's a dark space there, it's called the Faraday dark space uh, because Michael Faraday being the first person to observe it. Um, here we are again as the vacuum continues. We're at about uh, five tor at the present time, and you begin to see another dark space appearing down here, which is called the Crookes dark space. As the, there, now we can see the Crookes dark space down by the cathode. The ca let me get this marvelous pointer here. The Crookes dark space is being shown here. Here's the Faraday dark space. So in other words, electrons have accelerated to the point where they can excite in the lighter parts, ionize as it gets darker, and then it really gets dark in here as they slow down. And then they uh, accelerate in the field again and begin to uh, excite again. And, and you will see, I believe, as we go along, there'll be something called the positive column here, which is, uh, let's get to that some striations in this, barely see that. There we go. And those striations are basically uh, kind of a speed observation of, of how fast those electrons are traveling, that they either excite or ionize. Ionization recombination reactions produce a lot less light, fewer light photons than do the exciting and relaxing uh, uh, experiences. Uh, vacuum uh, technologies in the, uh, uh, let me get a good shot of that here. Um, uh, go back a little bit. The uh, vacuum, uh, the level of vacuum could be told by measuring the Crookes dark space, which you can see down in here. And the larger the dark space, Crookes dark space appears at about a tenth of a tor and begins to fill the entire tube as the vacuum continues. You could measure that, and uh, early vacuum technology was uh, set up uh, so that uh, you could you could measure it that way. Uh, uh, just looking, okay. So now, armed with uh, this knowledge, Birkeland observing uh, beautiful auroral displays. Uh, and you can see uh, various types here, uh, arc and ribbon displays. Uh, the green color here is, uh, uh, see what do I have written here? That's, uh, that's a lower altitude, uh, um, I guess, uh, this, um, response somewhere about 557 nanometers. Uh, that color we have, uh, I'll just go through these quickly. They're uh, just interesting effects. The colors, 
That's not that good. Yes, there, there's a good one. Uh, uh, only once in my life when I lived in Philadelphia, when I was a kid, did I ever see uh, such a tremendous display in the sky that was uh, totally fantastic uh, of all these colors, such as you see here. Uh, Birkeland's observations of this led him to try to understand exactly uh, what that's a nice one there too. Exactly what is is going on with this? Uh, essentially, uh, uh, there are a number of colors and their frequency ranges. It'll be in the paper. You can just look at here. Uh, essentially, electrons um, that are penetrating the atmosphere. I'm moving a little bit ahead here, but it, it, at the, the penetration at one kilo electron volts is about to 150 to 200 kilometers. If they get up to 10 kilo electron volts. It's a penetration to about 100 kilometers. And then above 20 up to 30 uh, keV, or you can get down into the 90 kilometer range. The protons are a little bit different. They need a lot higher amount of energy to penetrate down into the atmosphere. Uh, normally, the dominant color uh, that you see from atomic oxygen in these, uh, in these displays here uh, there's a beautiful one. Those are mostly red. That's uh, is is a green colored about 557 nanometers. That's for atomic oxygen. Uh, okay, a quick explanation of what's going on here, and and Birkeland actually hit the nail right on the head with this, uh, at least in his explanation of things. Uh, the uh, the sun being a, a, a sort of a marvelous source of quantum particles. Uh, uh, starting, I guess, somewhere in about the 1870s, a fellow by the name of Maunder had realized that there was a correlation between sunspots and auroral phenomenon because he had made a statistical study of the whole operation and found out that there was, I believe it was something called the Maunder minimum in the 18th century and where there were, for some 15 or 17 years, there was no auroral display at all. And up in the northern regions where that's very common, people began to wonder why, and that was documented. And uh, so uh, there was, a, uh, he uh, theorized that uh, the sunspots are actually uh, some kind of uh, magnetic windows in the sun's uh, chromosphere that, which uh, out of that uh, 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 very excited particles could be spewed out. And then the sun itself uh, having a tremendous uh, 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 magne interplanetary magnetic field could actually uh, send those particles throughout the solar system and when they would get near a planet that there would be certain effects taking place uh, and basically uh, Jim Cora mentioned this morning which I think was important talking about the you made a remark about the aurora as, as time goes on there's about 20 theories and back in these days there was one really theory that Birkeland had and a few other people but the theories uh, and, and there's a lot of information the more satellites that go up and the more information that's available uh, uh, there's a lot of opinions about how it works and I really don't want to spend time talking about that although this particular one doesn't look too bad uh, the interplanetary magnetic field brings uh, electrons and protons from the nuclear reactions on the Sun down and when they get near the uh, the Earth's uh, magnetic field or the magnetosphere there's a specific effect that produces the uh, I think it's called the magneto tail which uh, is uh, on the opposite side from the Sun out in back of the Earth and, and down in there when the uh, particles from the Sun's uh, own uh, um, transmission of these electrons and protons actually do get caught up in, in the uh, magnetic domains of the Earth and uh, are accelerated down those, uh, those uh, of, uh, force lines and come into the atmosphere and uh, depending upon the level that they are accelerated at, as you see here there's kind of a sorter going on up here that you have protons going to one side in the magnetic field and the electrons being brought to the other. Uh, one of the theories that I, I was reading recently is that the fact that the, the solar uh, inter interplanetary uh, magnetic field it becoming stronger and weaker, moving across the, the force lines in the Earth's magnetosphere, create a certain amount of a kind of a generator working that causes uh, particles to be pumped out of the uh, um, sort of a, like a storage battery. And when those activities are great, more of the electrons move down in, and protons as well, aurora, actually are produced by both of them. But that gets involved. Let's just talk about the electrons. And essentially what happens there is you have a, what do I do with it? You have a uh, this uh, auroral ring around the polar regions here. That's what this is. This is day side, night side, and so on. And and this is where you mostly see the aurora. That's why if you live in Ithaca, New York, you have a certain percentage chance of seeing it. If you live in uh, Daytona Beach, uh, that you might see it well, uh, never or once in your lifetime. And if you live in uh, Alaska or something, why well, you know you take it for granted, I suppose, because you see it quite a lot. 
as that ring is up in that particular area. Uh, this is just a uh, ultraviolet photograph of the sun showing certain dark areas in the magnetic field in the chromosphere that producing uh, move along from there. The yes, this is something here that I want to pay particular notice to. This is a uh, uh, product of the modern age. This is uh, satellite photographs of the auroral ring in the polar region, and it shows here this particular, again, the ring where these particles entering into the regions up there with the magnetic lines of force come around and allow those electrons to uh, penetrate and cause exciting and relaxing uh, reactions, giving us these light phenomena. Various colors commensurate with the atomic uh, responses of, the, of those gases. But uh, giving a particular, uh, there's a number of these. Uh, I show these specifically because early on in Birkeland's work, this was one of the first things that he observed, uh, this is some more satellite photographs, let's go through these, that's, that you can see, that's Antarctica there, um, with the auroral ring taken from the satellite. Uh, this is, uh, okay, I often wonder how I make these uh, particular slide arrangements. This is uh, Birkeland's uh, early uh, laboratory, and uh, if I can... Uh, And uh, see if my own eyes can see it. I can't see it that well. Anyway, uh, you can see his his uh, uh, mercury vacuum pump. So, and here is his Crookes type discharge tube. Here is a uh, generator. There, uh, DC. There are certain. Um, uh, my, my glasses are not up to the task here of seeing all. There are some. There are some letters in there that I had uh, noted that showed the various parts. But he had his vacuum pumps, his, uh, his uh, power supplies, which were, you can't see them here so much, were uh, uh, multi-disc uh, static electric generating machines and uh, induction coils of various size that he used. Uh, and here is a, the picture of his early discharge unit. Uh, you can see that the end down here Actually, whoever lent me this uh, laser pointer, thank you very much. That definitely uh, makes things a lot easier. Uh, you can see the cathode or anode, depending upon what he was going to do in it. In this case, it's an anode. Uh, here is a window down here with a, a kind of an O-ring, and that could be closed, and then you would pump the vacuum in it. And uh, there's also uh, several electrodes here, so you can do different. You can actually have this sphere here, which he called a terella, a terella, which... Uh, uh, had inside of it, uh, uh, you, this is a smaller one, but had an electromagnet, uh, and he had different configurations of these magnets, and he created, uh, you can s begin to see the curious effects that occur here, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, a particle of electrons leaving the, uh, this Tarella, and uh, you can see that with different magnetic uh, uh, workings here, there's a lot of phenomena that occur where the electrons are held in orbit around the, uh, the sphere, and um, uh, this resembles what I call a crook's tube because it has kind of a pear shape to it. And, and, um, and you will see this afternoon when we talk about crook's tubes, that was a common uh, shape to see. Uh, very curious. Uh, I can tell there's just certain glow discharge phenomenon up here that this is uh, the anode. You can tell by this anode glow that's available in it. Well, uh, he um, proceeded. Yes, here are uh, the first series of his... Uh, electron bombardment experiments in which the Terella was used as the anode, the positive electrode in the uh, experiment. And you can see that it is rather obvious, and so it was to Birkeland, that this auroral ring was being produced uh, here and along the polar regions uh, for the magnetic domains, you know, the, the lines of force coming around and bringing these electrons available from the cathode at a distance. So this, uh, uh, this, looking back at a few slides ago from the satellite photograph, uh, uh, Birkeland certainly, uh, uh, you know, had the right idea, and his experiments proved, uh, at least in this particular case, that, uh, that this, this was a working hypothesis. Here's some more um, of the same. Uh, there's many photographs available. Uh, it is, uh, I have to throw in here, um, and when you live around a great university, uh, or if you work for them, and so on, a lot of times you, uh, your opinion can kind of be a love-hate opinion. The things happen one way, things happen in another way. Uh, but I must say that, uh, that Cornell University has a, uh, a wealth of books and experimental stuff and equipment and uh, the loading docks for... I have a small organization called Midnight Electronics. That doesn't 
indicate that we go around and, and, and do things illegal, but most of the building managers always say, look, uh, uh, this is get this out of here. This is great, you know. Uh, but come back at midnight because none of the professors around. They see it taken out. They want us to keep it for another 20 years, and we don't need it. So uh, they have a tremendous resources. And so I was able actually to get Birkeland's original work on this and, and make the slides. Let's move on here. Some more of the same kind of phenomenon here. Different effects from uh, uh, magnetic uh, changes and t changes in the actual uh, uh, way that the uh, Terella was. Uh, uh, um, moved in the in the field of electrons from the cathode uh, that would be um, what do you call that yeah, doesn't matter uh, and here's some more again these are really quite spectacular seeing these various effects of, and uh, looking at what you would consider to be the night side and the day side auroral phenomenon and how the uh, effects of particles striking the Terella would it would have been made uh, and he uh, now his his vacuums that he used on this uh, he used a number of vacuums um, and they were in the range of about uh, from one micron a vacuum up to as high as a, about uh, one tor. Uh, and he varied all these things to see what kind of effects he could have. Actually, those of you that have ever seen gas x-ray tubes in operation know that the focus cathode in a gas x-ray tube is going to be very finicky. If the vacuum gets too low, then the focus recedes. And if the vacuum gets too high, the focus extends. So you don't get an exact focus on the target of the tube. And in the early days, they had to put regulators in x-ray tubes so that you could uh, keep a, a, a midline and take a good picture without losing your, your focus from the cathode. He experienced this and actually wrote a considerable amount about that effect here. Here's some more of the same. You can see the wires. That's upside down, but it's okay. You can see the wires extending into the Terella. For, for the, and he used, uh, actually, uh, there are some very interesting figures about the amount of, um, uh, of uh, magnetizing current that he used. He used up to as much as 50 amperes at uh, as much as, uh, how much did he use? Uh, uh, 80 volts, 100 volts. The, the amount of uh, the, uh, the magnetic field. Actually, he gave some figures in Teslas, which I thought was actually nice to see. Uh, actually, not not him, but later on analysis of his work used that. It was uh, some. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember. It was a considerable amount, varying that, and uh, his voltage that he applied to these tubes, depending on the vacuum, could go from about uh, as low as 600 volts up to about 22,000 volts. He had some pretty amazing equipment to do this. And here we go with a few more slides. All of these in the paper in the book go into a lot of details about what he was actually up to. Uh, OK, uh, of course, uh, like any good uh, Tesla coil builder uh, or hot rod or anybody, you know, the six-cylinder engine is not quite enough. Uh, so they have to try something larger. And you might be working with uh, 0.01 microfarad. That doesn't quite give you what you want. You have to move up and up. And gradually, so did Birkeland in here is an example of a box that he built. And this particular box, uh, my cheat sheet here, uh, the size of it is 36 by 36 by 55 centimeters. And uh, uh, here, the vacuum he's working with here is 0.01 millimeters of mercury. And this uh, it just shows the, the larger structure that he wanted to work with. And demonstrating here quite clearly, you can see the process here, obviously, from the effects here. It, just what I talked about a little earlier with the phenomenon of the vacuum discharge tube. Here is the Crookes dark space here. And this is the cathode glow. And uh, I think if you really looked up close, you can see the Ashton dark space in here. And here's the negative glow. And then here's the Faraday dark space up here. And then you, you begin to uh, approach, uh, you don't see all that. There wasn't a positive column in here. The, the structure is, uh, doesn't, I guess, lend to that. But again, you can see the electrons are obviously brought around and into the magnetic lines of force striking what would be, in this case, the polar region of the magnet, creating the auroral zone there. Uh, so he, uh, we have, oh yes, here's the next phase. We have the same thing again here. Now, this time what he did was to get into a really, uh, even a more advanced uh, thing with this. This whole uh, uh, operation over here is uh, covered with uh, um, uh, phosphorescent material. I, what did you say that was? I believe that we're looking at some form of, uh, of barium platino cyanide, which, by the way, was the uh, early uh, x-ray screen material that was used to observe x-rays. 
recently uh, I find out that uh, you can't get those anymore. <laughs> so uh, I feel that I have a fair collection of them and something that you know comes along. Anyway, they don't make them anymore. And Birkeland uh, uh, did this so that you could see he, he built a number of, of uh, well, we can move on and see that. Time is getting short. Uh, here we go. Uh, he used all kinds of different uh, pegs and effects in here, different magnetic, different attitudes, uh, even different vacuums to show different places where shadows were created. Again, looking at the many different ways of observing the, the electron bombardment of these targets uh, in line of trying to understand the particular effects that would take place in, in the atmosphere. And uh, these are very curious. There's a number of these we can look at. Here's some more. Strange looking, many effects. Um, There's a window in that uh, uh, following, I guess, off of some of the Crookes magnetic effect tubes, or you get a window, see the, 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 the beam striking. The, uh, uh, I guess these, I want to have these here. This is back again to the, uh, a few other experiments with the earlier tube. Have a look at that. Some more uh, magnetic effects. Uh, now, um, Moving right along here, uh, of course, uh, Birkeland began to stop and take a look at this and say, you know, some of these effects that are taking place, uh, he wondered if um, uh, comets and comet tails and the uh, Saturnian rings and other uh, phenomena that uh, observed by astronomers didn't, couldn't be explained uh, by this particular effect, these particular effects. And uh, it, in 1901, he actually uh, uh, decided that uh, uh, maybe the rings of Saturn, for instance, and we'll move along to see some other things. Could be, yeah, here's some very curious effects here. Couldn't be the fact that uh, there was some kind of a magnetic uh, arrangement uh, generated by the planet that was actually holding aggregate particles together in different uh, uh, rings around the planet, which I believe is the current uh, reality of that, those little sort of things that, you know. And he, uh, so he made a lot of experiments using, in this particular case, the using the Torella as a cathode so that the electrons that coming out of it, uh, the different effects uh, could be seen and he could vary his parameters and get these different effects. In the upper uh, right-hand corner is, uh, I, I don't know why uh, they shoved it in here, but it's a marvelous uh, photograph of an eclipse in uh, uh, 1901. Yeah, an eclipse in uh, May 17th, 1901, in which uh, uh, shows, and he uh, went into s some explanation about the idea of the uh, magnetic domains, uh, the, you know, the interplanetary magnetic forces displayed here uh, during the total eclipse. You can see these effects are rather interesting. Um, these were some experiments he was doing uh, with comet tails, trying to understand you know, what the actual uh, 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 composition of comets were. And he thought that there would, maybe there was some kind of, uh, uh, well, this was the carbon experiment. And he used uh, carborundum and charcoal and so on. And uh, when it was, uh, you can see, actually, when it was bombarded in the anode, you got all kinds of interesting effects. Uh, uh, it reminds us perhaps of carbon button lamp. Here's uh, some of the uh, positive column effects and so on. Uh, this, this, this goes into great detail, and I'm, I don't have the time to really get too carried away with this. Um, uh, in talking about comet tails and so on, this is, uh, uh, he used J.J. Thompson's earlier experiment with uh, uh, a, um, what is this, uh, the Lorentz force, when, when a, uh, when a, an electron encounters a, a, an electrical field, it can be pushed off at right angles to it. And I think Birkeland's idea here was that, that this particular idea here, these particles could, this looks like the, the head of a particular comet that he had looked at and began to experiment with that. Let's see. This is another uh, uh, thing that uh, a discharge tube, this was his own drawing, looking at, now here's the cathode here, the anode is over here. These are both... Uh, uh, cathodes again. This particular one is connected to the negative uh, pole, and this one is just grounded. And and he's trying to explain the idea that uh, that the electrons coming or the corpuscles he calls them coming from the sun, uh, striking where a comet is coming in uh, the, with the uh, mag the uh, the um, charge repulsion effects here would give you this idea of a, of a comet tail. And uh, although we know that the uh, uh, the uh, solar wind reaction with the uh, I guess the ice particles of a comet and, and, uh, and the ultraviolet uh, spectrum uh, 
uh, reaction what that causes melting of that and you get a tail tail effects this was Birkeland's original just a explanation of how it might work in terms of of, uh, of charge repulsion and uh, some magnetic effects uh, and here's the comet that he uh, had a, what he studied and liked uh, as an example of this Donetti's comet of 1858 which has a great photograph of that trying to explain some of these effects of the comet tail uh, there's another great one there and that's um, uh, varying the magnetic field and the and the and the voltage that is present on the in this case the Torella is a is negative in giving off electrons uh, showing how as he claimed that the Saturnian rings might be held in place by a particular effect of the magnetic domains of the planet versus the uh, particles that uh, or the, that field emanating and particles being held in place by it uh, Here's some more very curious effects again with the Saturnian ring idea. And this over here is something he, you'll see as we get to the last of the photographs, he started using uh, capacitors and, and having pulse uh, effects with his uh, experiments. And he began to get these particular, he called them um, pencil holes where they would pencil rays would shoot out from these particular things with a disruptive uh, discharge effects uh, put on the Torella. And we can see some more of these. Yes, there's, there's some more. Uh, we're running out of time here, but I swore that this year Michael was not going to come up and tap on his watch when I was just getting my stride, and it's going to work out, I promise you. I have uh, Lowell's watch right here, and I think I have four minutes to finish, and I will do it. Uh, this again is a uh, another a disruptive uh, discharge being pulsed through that, and you can see the, again, this is the Terella being the cathode, and these pencil rays emanating out from it. Um, curious effects. Here is uh, Birkeland himself. You can see this is, he's even moving into, oh no, this is the, the, the same size uh, uh, stand that he has. And here's uh, Birkeland himself at the controls. Over here, I think, is his capacitor bank. And uh, uh, what else is around here? I think you can see some, uh, uh, some mercury uh, uh, sprangle type pumps and so on in the laboratory. Uh, some more experiments of that Saturnian ring nature. Let's see. This is rather beautiful. Uh, again, this was uh, an arrangement of um, this is a complicated one. Uh, this uh, pulses, high current pulses and with the uh, a dipolar magnetic field in the, uh, in this case where you're getting this obvious effect of the, but in this case instead of uh, the particles actually uh, emanating from the Torella itself. You can see that the metal plates on the floor and above are where the, the actual pencil rays were emanating from. And then they, uh, as it was shown, shown earlier, produced that auroral ring effect and strike against the Torella. Um, another kind of what he called the nebular effect, how nebulas might be formed and so on. Here's, uh, uh, now this is the larger uh, this is the larger Terrell sphere in the larger case with thicker glass and had to keep, they had some accidents with this to keep building uh, thicker uh, experimental equipment here. And this is uh, uh, Birkeland on the left and uh, Olaf uh, Davik, his uh, assistant on the right. Again, uh, actually this looks like uh, some kind of amazing uh, Tesla coil capacitor bank of sorts, which I don't, I don't know. That's a real beautiful one there. This is where the, the Torella is the cathode. See the magnetic domain there, which is quite nice. It's interesting to see these laboratories. They all kind of have that, that turn of the centro, that same kind of wooden look to them, all the kind of, you know, when they, and when, you know, one of these uh, uh, on the fringe flaky characters, they shove them out in the, uh, in the back somewhere to some sort of a uh, unused, uh, barn or whatever. Uh, I, I believe the Curies had the worst possible uh, kind of place to work to make one of the greatest experiments. Perhaps there's something to that, you know, uh, some kind of posh, nice place to work is doesn't produce the effects that might be produced when you're freezing your rear end off and, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and, and there's, you know, problems all over the place, you know. So, 
uh, and this is uh, this is the changing the same experiment, changing the polarity around again, uh, where the uh, the terella is uh, is the anode in this particular case. You can see the discharge phenomenon in the tube. I'd love to have seen this equipment up close. Must have been one heck of a thing to look at. T Eleven o'clock on the nose. How about that? I've made it within the time frame. Thank you very much, and uh, field some questions if you'd like.